Hello again, it's uh, Paul Beckwith, and I'm talking all about the Arctic sea ice, and I'm talking about a paper that was published uh, a while ago that tried to examine how predictable uh, is the first ice-free Arctic summer. Can we pin it down and predict when that will happen? And uh, so I'm continuing um, the theme of my previous two videos, and back in 2017, I thought that the probability of a blue ocean event, no sea ice in the Arctic in a September, was very high for it to uh, occur within the next five years. And that was in 2017, so that would be by 2022. And uh, based on the recent behavior of the sea ice extent in the Arctic, um, things are a lot more complicated than we think. There's a, there, there, there looks like there might be some you know, negative feedbacks that keep the ice there a bit longer, although that's not clear because the volume is still pushing against record lows even though the extent stalled out. So I'm talking about all these things in, in this uh, series of videos. So you can have a look at this paper yourself, this article, guest post, how predictable is the first ice-free Arctic summer. So where I left off from the uh, previous um, video, um, it, the idea is that natural variability of the climate system can have a big impact on the ice. And the thinner the ice is, the larger the impact can be. So they give the example um, uh, back in 2016, there was an unusually warm winter. So the Arctic sea ice maximum in March was the smallest in the satellite record. So some speculated that 2016 might be on course to beat the 2012 record low for the summer sea ice minimum. But there was cool and stormy weather in the summer, um, so the ice uh, didn't melt out as quickly, and it was actually tracking as the third lowest summer extent on record that year. So they looked at natural variability and how it affects the long-term predictability of an ice-free summer. They used sporty simulations and climate models they ran many simulations and they basically determined that the Arctic, the uncertainty for Arctic sea ice predictions due to natural fluctuations of the climate system um, led to um, uncertainty of around two decades. So basically they said that you can't predict when there'll be, uh, when the ice will disappear within a window, better than a window of, to within a window of about 20 years. And then based on the rate of greenhouse gas emissions, the speed of ice melt also depends, of course, on how, you know, if we're able to slow, cut global emissions to slow the pace of rising temperatures. And they found that added the choice of emission pathways between RCP 8.5 and RCP 4.5, for example, added another five years to the uncertainty. So basically, they said that you can't predict, uh, you know, when the sea ice will go to within better than 25 year prediction. So you could say, well, yeah, it's going to happen in the next 25 years. But, um, you know, so the, the high emission pathway showed between 2032 and 2053, medium one between 2043 and 2058. OK, and there's all different models and stuff, but they're saying that you know, you just can't pin it down. Okay, so that was the point of this paper. Um, do I actually think that, believe that? Not sure. I mean, let's look at the actual paper. Um, here's the paper here. Um, but before we do that, let's look at the, I, let, let's look at some of the basic properties of ice ice growth, okay, thin to thick. Okay, there's a couple, um, this is based on, so you can have a look, I highly, highly recommend that you look at this site, you know, lake ice from a recreational perspective, lakeice.squarespace.com, ice growth. Okay, so of course it depends on how cold it is, so any, if it, if it, and, and we can talk about freezing degree days. So ice growth rate depends on freezing degree days. Um, and also there's another method that uses a Swedish method. It uses a combination of air temperature, wind speed, and radiational cooling. 
and this is most accurate for thin ice up to a couple inches. Okay, so once the first layer of ice catches on a lake, it grows thicker at a rate that is dependent on air temperature, windiness, radiational cooling, the thickness of the ice sheet, and any snow or frost that, built, that is built up on the ice sheet. Okay, so temperature is the easiest to assess. We talk about freezing degree days. It's the average number of degrees below freezing over 24 hours. And this is in Fahrenheit, I should warn you. So if the t average temperature over a day is 17 degrees, that's 15 degrees below the 32, the freezing point of fresh water. So it's 15 freezing degree days. And with those conditions, in theory, the ice will grow at a rate of about one inch per 15 freezing degree days, as long as the ice starts between a half inch and three inches thick. So if it's in this range, and it's this 15 freezing degree days, then it will grow about an inch. Um, okay, um, but as the ice gets thicker and thicker, the growth rate decreases because ice is a good insulator so there's thermal resistance so the thicker the ice is the slower the growth rate okay um, and this is based on being if there's a bit of wind if the sky is clear so the radiation can just go long wave radiation can go right up into space it's not reflected back by clouds no snow and frost on the ice um, then the ice growth um, then, then, then the ice growth is, will be fast but if there's no wind or there's cloudy skies, the ice growth will be considerably slower. Okay, so that's bit the basic idea. So as we lose more and more Arctic sea ice, as it gets thinner and thinner, the growth rate rapidly increases in the fall. Okay, so that's uh, like a negative feedback and it gives the ice some resiliency. Um, this is interesting, 27 millimeters of ice, not quite enough to stay on top. If there's another one millimeter, then it can support 175 pounds. Okay, so you need 20 to 30 freezing degree days to make it thick enough to safely walk on. Okay, um, and so basically um, there's a lot of other stuff in here, but I want to show you a couple curves. Um, so this is, uh, you know, if it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, for 24 hours, the ice will grow, you know, to this thickness, four inches of thick. So as, notice the curve, is not a straight line. So as the ice gets thicker and thicker, then the rate of growth slows down. So these curves are all angling off a bit. They're, they're not following a straight line. They're, they're, they're less than a straight line because of that effect. Ice growth over a week, same sort of thing. Ice growth over a month, same sort of thing. Okay. So, and then there's a, a, a formula here, the thickness of the ice growth depends on all of these different factors, uh, temperature difference um, uh, between the water and the air and so on, the thickness of the ice, or sorry, this is the thickness, uh, the thickness of the ice will be TM. Um, temp this is temperatures rather, and this is the thickness of the ice. So there, there, So there's a one half here, so it follows this curve like the square root curve coming up here like this. Okay, so that's uh, all about ice growth. Um, really interesting article. Highly recommend that you uh, take, your, take the time to read it. Now getting back to this, how predictable is the timing of summer ice-free Arctic? Um, you know, I can, there, there's some interesting uh, stuff in here, you know, the, what we observe and the models um, and, uh, but I want to come down to this, uh, plot, if I can find it. Um, where is it? Okay, well, I guess these are the key. I thought there was some other stuff in here, but, okay, well, these plots here, this is the models, this is the ice. You know, most of the models are under predicting, um, but this is a regime where there's lots of thick ice around the edges. So, you know, as we go to thinner and thinner ice and a different regime, it's quite possible that there's some negative feedbacks and the models will actually be able to predict it more accurately. I'm not sure. Um, this is a big learning uh, process for me as well, actually. Uh, lots of new papers, lots of interesting things on this. So this is the 
basically different models, okay, all these different models, the observations, um, and this is the frequency of occurrences and the different model runs of the year of first reaching an ice-free Arctic. So there's some models that show um, very, very soon, okay, but most of the models um, are showing, you know, 20, 40, you know, that sort of thing. Some of the models are extended way out. Um, you know, it depends on the parameters, depends what you pick. Um, so there's a lot, you know, we just don't know, basically. <laughs> I mean, the models are, are saying that we still will have the ice for a long period of time. You know, most people um, don't think that, um, you know, if they... I haven't thought that for a long time, and I still don't probably, but I'm not as confident that, you know, it's going to be just a few years before the ice uh, is gone. Um, anyway, these, these are all, you can access all of these papers. I, you know, if you're really into this stuff, you can have a look. You don't have to rely on, um, you know, what I say about them. Okay, and uh, yeah, so this is another paper uh, variability of Arctic sea ice sickness using PO mass and um, uh, community Earth system models, CESMs. And, uh, you know, lots of information on here about sea ice volume and stuff. And there, it's a plot in here that I want to show you. Okay, so this is a regional look. Uh, this is sea ice sickness in meters in the different regions, Central Arctic Basin, Greenland, Beaufort, Chukchi Sea, you know, etc. And remember, you can have a look at this um, plot here of the Arctic to see the regions I'm referring to, Beaufort, Chukchi Sea, and so on. Okay, um, and so it shows the ice thickness decreasing over time in these models, and then these are the periods when it drops below half a meter. Um, and so when the ice gets super, super thin in these regions, so we're already seeing that in the Barent Kara Sea, Laptev Sea. Okay, this is the mean with the error bars. Here's 2020, which we're rapidly approaching. Okay, so ice has gone here and here. Lots of ice has gone here. Beaufort Chuck, he's next. But it shows the central Arctic maybe going by 2025, between 2025 and 2040 with a mean of like 2032 or something. No ice in the central Arctic. And then it shows the ice in the Greenland Sea, a fast ice. It thinks that will stick around the longest. I'm not so sure that this will stick around. I think this will go before this. So if this curve, if this is sort of the correct idea and this goes, then we're looking at maybe, you know, anywhere from 2024 or 2025 to 2040 for the ice vanishing in the central Arctic. I think this curve should be more down in this region here. But, you know, we'll see. Anyway, it's very interesting, um, very, very interesting paper. Um, again, have, have a look at it. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's accessible. Okay, so, so that's, uh, you know, when Zach is talking about the study where they look at projections of sea ice sickness and found an increasing probability by the mid-21st century, 2040s. This is the link to the, the paper which I was just showing you. Okay, um, and there's lots of other comments and stuff. Arctic sea ice age, um, lots of interesting stuff. Okay, now, so that's what we have so far. So the question is, uh, you know, when will the sea ice go? So it depends on, you know, um, we don't know for sure. Okay, we don't know. It looks like climate variability um, is having a larger and larger factor on the ice. What we do know is, so I'll just go back to the plot here. Okay, so one of the things is that the, the ice is clearly, you know, as we get less and less ice, um, it's grouping up around the uh, pole, around the North Pole. Okay, it's still extending to Greenland. You know, cold water around Greenland could keep the water cool so that it can regrow there quickly. Um, there's a lot of factors, but it looks like maybe the ice of about north of 80 degrees will, will, will last longer. I'll continue, thanks.